Hello everyone and welcome to the Resilient Sessions, a podcast that brings together injured veterans from Blesma, the limbless veterans charity, and a well-known public figure to share stories of overcoming challenges of all kinds. The podcast provides an opportunity for our guests to chat with one another about their stories, sharing how they overcome their ups and downs so we can learn from them both. We hope you enjoy it. Uh, so hello and welcome to this special bonus episode of The Resilient Sessions. My name is Hannah Whittingham and I'm the producer of the series and I'm joined by two much more familiar voices, Alice Driver and Stuart Harris. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. You both look a little bit worried. <laughs> <laughs> We're on our best bad. behaviour. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. Nice. Um, So we decided we wanted to put an extra bonus episode in this series for a couple of reasons. Firstly, as a bit of a review so that we can share some of our favorite moments, the things that meant a lot to us throughout this series, but also so we can hear a couple of new extraordinary stories from you two. So Stuart Harris, it's going to be full names from now on, very formal. (laughs) Stuart Harris, we're going to come to you first. Uh, so you, uh, okay. you've you done an episode. You did our series one, uh, yeah, yeah, which was yeah. great. And for those of you who've heard it, you'll know a little bit about Stu's story. But for those of you who haven't, Stu served with the 1st Battalion of the Welsh Guards. Um, and whilst on tour in Afghanistan in 2012, a roadside bomb hurled Stuart's vehicle into a ditch, leaving him with brain damage, the result of which has left him partially sighted and partially deaf. Stuart was later diagnosed with PTSD before leaving the army at the age of 30. But today, Stuart works for the Soldier Charity and is a Making Generation R speaker, inspiring tens of thousands of people with his story of resilience. So, Stuart Harris. Hello. <laughs> first of all, uh, how did you come to be a part of Making Generation R? If, well, first of all, I'm, I, is that my bio? <laughs> that sounds like someone Does else. It? That's in- uh, yeah, it's mental, isn't it? Um, but yeah, um, making Generation R. So um, I'm very lucky to be a Blesma member, um, a charity, uh, and uh, they're brilliant with me. And it started when I was in a mental health clinic when I was in there. They, they would put house adaptions on and stuff like that. And then as time went by, they started uh, collaborating. And one uh, group they collaborated with was uh, the Drive Project. And um, and they thought, you know, we've got all these members with incredible stories and they really have, the stories are mm-hmm. amazing. And um, they thought we want to teach these guys how to deliver, uh, a, a, you know, talk. Because it is, there is an art to it that definitely mm. is. It's, yeah. No, Sorry, so, so your, that whole incident for you in Afghanistan was in 2012. Yeah, so yeah, eight right, years yeah. ago. How long after it did you start working with the Drive Project? Um, so I was in hospital for about two years and rehabilitation centers right. and stuff. I would say that I started in 2015, okay. 16, around that time. Yeah, it was one of the, the yeah. first hey, waves. I like remember. Guys. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, one of the first wave. Uh, it was me. And um, I remember, so it was very nerve wracking. We all went to the, the, the Union Jack Club and... Um, I was with other members, so I'm very lucky to be a blessed member. I'm not limbless, so mm. they can luckily kind of eyesight as a limb. So because I'm blind in the right eye and partially in the left, they, they, um, I'm, I come under their umbrella, sure. if you like. So I'm at the Union Jack Club, and two of the guys that I'm on the speaking course with, one was a guy called Andy Reid, who's a triple amputee, right. and another one was Mark Ulmrod, who's a triple amputee. And... When the next morning, when we got to this sort of recording studio, sort of with full of mirrors and stuff like that, and these guys are cutting about. And the thing is, Andy Reid and Mark Homer were already quite seasoned speakers. Right. And I was like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> how, what am I, am I going to have to stand up in front of these and tell them my story, you know? And what it taught me by the end of the week is everyone has got a story no matter what. And I was done my uh, refresher course a few weeks ago. So I got to listen to a few more new stories of Lesma members that I've hung around for, with for years, but never heard their story because mm. it's not something you really talk about. And it's it's always very humbling, heartwarming, 
um, and just incredible. It's an incredible thing I'm involved in, and I feel very lucky. And this is just amazing. Wow. So, yeah. What, I, I'm forever. I don't want to embarrass her, but Alice, you're amazing. Ah. Well, we'll, Thanks, we'll come yeah. to Alice in just a moment. We're, we're <laughs> saving the best till last. That's a terrible thing to say to you, Stuart. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, no, Thank but to all. stay. <laughs> <laughs> to stay with you now that I've made you feel second class, um, <laughs> how how did that change your process of, of sort of mental recovery as much as anything else, telling your story and, and being able to do that to people? Yeah, so people do worry sometimes after you've told your story and everyone's different, aren't they? Uh, I never feel bad or empty. Or that, you know, some people come up to me thanking me for saying my story. Some people come up in absolute bags of tears. Uh, and um, yeah, so, but I never actually feel any. I don't know if it's a little bit of a therapy, you know, it's good to talk, you know, and I, it, it definitely is good to talk. But after I've told my story, I just, it's the easiest story to tell because you're just being honest and open about your life. But obviously we need that um, generation R2 short of I was going to say, because you, you say yeah. that's an easy thing, but that can't have been easy for you yeah. the first time that you tried to tell yeah. that. That's that's a big process to be able to, to go through. Yeah, the, yeah it's just, it's, so all, all I really struggle with is getting my ducks in a row, if mm. you like, in, you know, Corridor. I can't say that. Chronological. Chronological order. <laughs> what is it when you have your books? Oh, Chronological. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, that's uh. the magic. Uh, I'm not even going to try and attempt to say it, but so you, you know what I mean. Thank you, Alice. And um, and the the brain damage sometimes I struggle a little bit with that. That's probably my biggest hurdle when telling my mm. story. Other other than that, you know, I actually like doing it. I like talking about mental health. I I actually love it. And when I got to speak with you know Johnny Benjamin and stuff like that uh, when I did series one. Uh, that was amazing. And the feedback you get sometimes, people seeking you out on the likes of social media, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, one week won't go by where I get w at least one message from someone. Wow. Not one week uh, will say, I've been struggling. Thank you so much. Because obviously there's a few videos still out there from what we've done in the past. Uh, so yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's absolutely incredible what we're doing. But yeah, I, I absolutely love telling my story. And I'm so glad I've learned how to deliver it in a you know, a, a better Amazing. way. Um, and now you're also a presenter. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, yeah Stuart yeah, Harris, the yeah. co-presenter. Yeah, it's all good. Like it's it's it's, it's brilliant. That's uh, fr from just f so that learning how to that spending that week with then you know the drive project. Um, it's it's led me to go on. It's opened so many doors. You know, I'm able to now confidently go into job interviews. Um, and, you know, I, 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 part of the reason I'm employed today is because of, you know, making Generation R, because I'm able confidently to sit in front of people, no matter who they are, you know, I've delivered talks to royalty, down to, you know, to, to students, you know, counsellors, whatever, um, you know, CEOs, they're there to hear my story and, uh, and I'm there to deliver mm. it. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's given me so much confidence uh, to the point where I am here interviewing and presenting with Alice and interviewing other guys, you know, that are in a similar situation. Yeah. And it's, it's just fantastic. I, yeah, I love it. Very well, lucky. We're, very we lucky. are very lucky to have you, Stuart Harris. <laughs> I'm just going to persist with the full name right oh. until the very end. Thank you. I love the full name. It's like uh, like it girls when they come home, you know, and they mention full, they, they full name everyone. Yeah. Just full name everyone. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, Tommy Atkins. Yeah. Exactly, that, right? exactly. Full, name. full yeah. respect. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's so funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, Stu. Uh, Alice Driver, you get a full name as well. Yay. Um, so, um, Alice, you're probably the one that we know the least about. Alice was originally a West End theatre producer. Um, but she combined her experience of theatre and people development to set up the first theatre recovery project for the Ministry of Defence. And then as well as designing and establishing two groundbreaking nationwide UK arts recovery projects, Alice's work has won numerous awards, including the Amnesty Award. It's inspired BBC One documentaries. And she is the creator of Social Enterprise, The Derive Project and This Very Podcast. Mm. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I haven't even included half your biography there. 
that I mean that's just that yeah, yeah we that would be like an episode in it in itself um but let's start at the at the start how did the drive project come about um well the drive project it didn't it didn't it was sort of a byproduct of the work that I did originally so this play the two worlds of charlie f which was the first recovery project for the mod um that came first so i i met um a wounded soldier and he told me that when you become injured you lose your sense of self you lose your purpose and you lose your voice and being working in the theater we all know that you know theater gives a platform to tell stories and to give people uh, an opportunity to use their voice. So it just struck me as like, oh, this is, I've got an idea. Let's write a new play based on the stories of uh, service personnel who've been wounded. They'll perform it on stage in the West End, a couple of performances, great. And luckily I was hugely naive as to the reality of what that meant. Um, (laughs) Otherwise I don't think I ever would have started it. And just, uh, just everything just was meant to be. And I managed to get, you know, Trevor Nunn uh, overseeing the project. He brought in the director. Yeah, casual, you know, so Trevor and um, he brought in this amazing, yeah, Trev and... Uh, Stephen Rain, who is this wonderful director, Owen Shears, yeah. who sort of won a BAFTA for his work. He wrote the play. And then we had Chris Terrell, this documentary maker. Who, And then I knew that if I stood up and said to, a, you know, a bunch of, of wounded soldiers that theatre is really cool, that they'd all be like bog off, basically. <laughs> um, and so Ray Winstone became the, the, the sort of star of it and the face of it. And it, it it was just, I just had this vision that I could see being in the Haymarket Theatre and everyone up on stage and it was just going to be an amazing thing. And it, 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 it really was. I mean, ultimately, we created this play that got five star reviews. We sold out. We did two tours of the UK. We went to Canada. It inspired other pro- projects around the world. But ignoring all of that what it actually did was it had a positive impact on those people involved. And for some people it was life-changing and it showed the MOD. It showed all the naysayers, which there were lots, you know, the first thing the MOD said to me when I said, you know, let's do this. They said, this sounds like airy fairy therapy shit. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I had commanding officers coming up to me after they'd seen the show and shaking my hand and saying, I owe you an apology because I was one of those people who said, I think this is just going to be a freak show or are they taking advantage? You know, all of these. So it was, it was groundbreaking in so many ways. And so in a very long answer to how did the drive project start, we did all of these amazing things, went on this wonderful journey and and then after the tours had finished, I was like, right, what should I do now? And sort of, I needed a a business to start doing these more projects. So I set up the drive project and kind of, that was five years ago now. When you got to the point of having done that show and had that success and had those people apologize to you, was it plain sailing from that point on now that you had the backing of everyone or was this just another thing to have to plug away at to convince people that actually involving theatre in this way uh, is going to be something that's useful to people who traditionally perhaps wouldn't be associated with the theatre. I think now we're in a totally different place. Mm. The arts is perceived now as being a valid um, recovery option, you know, alongside sports and adventurous training. And now I know the MOD uses it, military charities use it. And that's what is so wonderful. So some people still don't get it, but that's okay. You know, we've got enough evidence. All our work is independently evaluated. So I can either put an evaluation in front of someone's eyes, or I can just say, go and speak to that person over there who's come and got involved and see what they say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
yeah nice. it's yeah it's wonderful great it's great um and so talk to me about making generation r which is also um your baby <laughs> yes yeah, so um well off the back of the two worlds and um, blesma had had seen it and um and barry Le- the then chief exec barry agree and um said you know we want to do something with the arts for recovery for our people and can you come up with some ideas so i came up with some ideas and it had to have three parts one which was um about upskilling uh the second was about giving the blesma members an opportunity to to share and uh and give back to their community um so actually let's say there's two parts there <laughs> all gone a bit monty python exactly exactly let's um so i came up with some ideas and they said we one of them was about uh taking a blesma member story teach them how to tell their story and going into the community and allowing them to give back and have a and and show people that you know there are different ways you can get over adversity and challenges Mm. and um Swifty, Darren Swift, who is on this series, yes. he and I have been friends for years. He was in Charlie F. And so right. he and I went and workshopped this at a hostel in East London. And so Swifty wow. told his story and I did a workshop around adversity. And we were laughing about it the other day because no one really spoke English. <laughs> Um, no one really wanted us to be there, but oh, yeah. luckily we had some custard creams and we were doing, and we were having pizzas at lunch and like, that's, that's fine then. That's exactly. All. exactly. When you say hostel, what, what kind of a hostel are you talking about? Cause in my mind, I've got like some sort of backpacking scenario. No, going on. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it was a hostel, um, with, uh, it was a ma- male hostel and it had all sorts of nationalities in there. Right. And it would, but actually, what happened was something really, really magical. Like we brought all of these people into a room, and we did some exercises. We played games. Swifty told his story, which just sort of, for those who understood it, like it <laughs> broke down the eyes. But we just, and it all ended, and just it was a really wonderful day. And mm. obviously, we did some more testing, and so that's when the idea came up. And you know, since then we've trained up, I think, nearly seventy-five Blesma members to tell their stories. Wow! And hostels, sto- <laughs> it, and luckily not in hostels. And and luckily, I've never spoken. Um, you know, I was able to bring in the most amazing trainers. Uh, you know, from sort of the National Theatre, Young Vic, uh, professional storytellers like Claire Murphy, um, Kate Beals, Al Najari, uh, Jack. Um, Pinter. Oh, I can't remember Jack. <laughs> we can find that Katri- out. We'll yeah, put exactly. it in, the, in the notes in the podcast. Um, and they're just, they've made it wonderful. And then these stories have gone out to over 100,000 young people and first responders. Wow. And yeah. So it's, I mean, you said at the beginning, it, it, it's your baby. It's like, it. back then it was, but now it's just, it's yeah. got its own life and it's amazing. You're now you're now in the head honcho, which for, for those of you listening to this podcast, Alice is currently sat in what can only be described as a throne <laughs> <laughs> with what looks like a stole behind you, which is Exactly. Even, yeah. Exactly. Even, that's even better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> it's very Game of Thrones. Um, so the podcast, Alice, how mm. how did that come about? Growing out of um, making Generation R, or obviously standing for resilience for anyone who hasn't worked that out yet. <laughs> yes, exactly. Making Generation R, so making the next generation of resilient um, people. Um, so I was, so we'd obviously taken these stories out far and wide, but we kept having more people saying, please, can you come and tell your story to us? And what's so great about Blesma, they fund the whole project. They all of these workshops and talks are free for schools and first responders. Um, But outside of that, it's hard for other people to access it. So I was chatting to Cy Harmer, who does a podcast with Carol Vorderman, and he came up with the idea of doing a podcast. 
um, so that these amazing people and stories can be heard by more more people around the world, hopefully. And uh, and then we just thought, let's team them up with a well-known figure and put two individuals together who you might not have necessarily ever thought would come together and to have a conversation around life and challenges and how they've overcome it. And and what a lovely two series it's been. It's um it's been extraordinary. The people that have been involved in the the veterans that that have taken part as well. Um it's been an amazing line. Yeah. Yeah. And celebrity, yeah. It? Which brings us to the next part of this episode, which is your favorite moments. Little little bits and pieces that uh that meant a great deal to you. Um I mean it, it was I don't know about you guys, but it was a very difficult thing to choose <laughs> just a few of these. Because basically I could have just gone the yeah. whole podcast. Uh. <laughs> that will that will be my highlight. Thanks. Um but Alice, let's start with you. Okay. What were uh, a few of your let's start with with whichever your first one you want to choose is as your little S- moment. So my first sort of moment or highlight was with Chris Akabusi and Matt Armitage. Um, and I loved this podcast. I think as a side point, I've never laughed so much in any <laughs> podcast before. It was hilarious. Um, but Chris is talking about the significant people who um, in his life and he talks about magical thinking And he explains um, that magical thinking is this childlike faith in that everything's going to be all right on the night. Amazing. Okay, let's let's take a little listen to that section. You know, I mean, I I have magical thinking, um, and I do. What's that? Well, magical thinking. Well, magical thinking is, is is childlike. So I've got a childlike faith. Okay. And. And a magical thinking that it, it will be all right at night, and 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 my life has been like that, it, it, you know. I mean, the kid in the children's home. The way I got to the children's home was on a train from from Portsmouth to to, to London. Just took me and my brother sat on a train to London. Anything could have happened, but we got picked up by nice people and taken to the train station. Oh, taken to the um, from the train station, taken to the police station. Again, this magic, this, some people just came into my life. Yeah. They were the good guys, not the bad guys. Took me to the police station. We got found out to North London. Magical wow. thinking. You know, the copper who, 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 who spoke to us was a mag- you know, he could have been, he could have been absolutely, you know, he could give me dog's breath. He could have absolutely tore my hair off, right? Mm. But he was magical. Changed my life. Amical Chris. Keezy, 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 come and stay with us. And, and it was magical. You know, anything could have happened. But no, she took a shine to us. The Gillies took us in. I'm still good friends with the Gillies. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dick, Neil, Steve and Dawn, they're, 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 they're the kids of my age group. And then, like you said, Scott McKenzie. Magical. I mean, he's a sergeant. Yeah. Transactional. He didn't have to be transformation in my life. But he gained through my life. And so, and I find, uh, me, I found out in life, things always turn out all right in the end. That whole episode was also one of my mm. favourites. Um, but why that particular moment for you, Alice? Well, I think um, there are two reasons. Firstly, he talks about their... Um, he says this wonderful phrase about that the people in his life, they were, rather than being transactional, they were transformational. Yes. And I just think, wow, you know, that is such an incredible thing to say. And I've never really thought about that before. And I suppose me as an individual, I've reflected that on that and, and just think, OK, I could be a transformational person. I could have that impact rather than being a transactional person. So it's just mm. a choice in life that you want to make and thinking about sort of your legacy and who do you want to be? And I just think that has just really struck stayed with me yeah and then the second thing is is the magical thinking that it all will be all right in the night and then matt pulls this sort of thread through and he says well for me it's just the same as hakuna hakuna matata you know it means no worries and he gives some examples about that you know 
more mundane things like the everyday life there's no point getting anxious or worried and I suppose why I took it away from both of them is that you know it's so easy in life to always think of the worst scenario to be anxious to and actually both of them are, are the like let's believe in the good let's believe that actually it is going to be okay and we are being looked after mm. and just what a lovely way to live your life yeah yeah they were both great mm. so Stuart what is uh what's your little moment your first moment uh, well, my first one is got to be um, Steve Swanson and uh, Jack Cummings. And um, Steve says uh, something like, uh, uh, we are one small planet in the universe. Um, we are one group and we are all the same. Mm. Let's listen to that little clip. And have how have your experiences changed your views on the world or the way that you behave in it? I don't know if it changed much, but it definitely reinforced it. You know, mm -hmm. and I say talk about looking back on Earth, you know, and you see it as one ecosystem. And I think that's a big difference we have. You know, we come out, you know, being down on Earth, it's always like you have different countries, you know, you know, all these other things going on. People, you know, of course, disagreeing on all sorts of different issues, all these things happening, conflict all over. And you look at it from the space, it's just one small planet, very, very small planet in this vast universe, right? And and it's just and we are so close, you know, our, our atmosphere is actually quite thin. And if we didn't have that, you know, uh, we'd be in the vacuum of space and it wouldn't be a very good day for us humans. And uh, it's just like, we are really in this fragile situation and in this one ecosystem on this one ball. And we have to think of it differently that way. We have to think of it as we're just one group on this planet. And we have to more, I think, live more, in, you know, if we can, of course, in, in unison and unity. Uh, but uh, that's what I would like to see, of course. But because uh, that kind of gives you that, that viewpoint that, that it's, you know, we're not different. We're all the same. Stuart, wow. it's been a sort of a, a a running joke with the production team that uh, <laughs> yeah. Steve Swanson is is basically your superhero. <laughs> he really is. He really, really is. I was really it's... struggling before every, uh, leading up to it. I didn't sleep. Um, <laughs> it was. It, I was so excited. I was locked on before an hour before. It's yeah. Um, he, he's uh, uh, you know people that explore. That's something great about us as human beings isn't it to explore you know animals don't go out exploring and mm. stuff like that and or you know vast worlds and countries and stuff but it's, it's just amazing what he does and yeah um i know that yeah it's just absolutely so that that I particular clip that he made obviously you could have chosen his whole episode again but uh but that yeah. particular clip why why that one uh particularly uh i i because he he he, he he sees it as a privilege and I get that. So he, he's out there at space looking at our planet and he's, he, you know, we, we put ourselves in boxes, don't we? Uh, and he, he has the privilege of seeing one, you know, the hu we're just one, aren't we? We're just a human race. You know, he doesn't, from that point, he doesn't see differences. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it was really just a lovely thing to hear. Mm -hmm. Um, and I and I wish that was the case sometimes that we just all just be, I don't know, just be a bit kinder to each other yeah. and, and, and and just see ourselves as one. We've got so many problems in the world, you know. And he talks a little bit about the environment, and hopefully we will address that. And he, he's a great, you know, ambassador for that sort of mm. stuff. And that's but that's yeah, what really got me about that as well is is talk about how it, fragility and how actually how fragile mm, yeah. the human race is. He was saying how thin it, he was saying how yeah. thin the, um, the 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 layer was, was yeah the, you know the ozone layer and yeah and there is some it's quite to hear it from someone like that it's quite yeah. scary yeah 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 he was just like very sort of yeah I just did my PhD and then, oh, how many was he against you know when he was going to be an astronaut oh god they're, they're like seventeen thousand it's yeah it's insane the numbers that they they sort of whittle it down to because I think they have <clears throat> up to nowadays I think it's like three thousand applications a year or something. Yeah, amazing guy. Juggling mm. children, PhDs, full-time job for NASA. Oh. Casual. Yeah. Mm. He, he was super casual, wasn't he? Yeah, just did it in his yeah, spare time. Exactly, you know, so exactly. Was, really, yeah, I, I won't talk about it. <laughs> yeah. The Steve Swanson fan club. Yeah, exactly, yes. exactly. Yeah. Um, so my first one is actually a shared moment between uh, Judith Owen, who is a, a musician and a, a comedian, and Stefan, who was the veteran that was with her. 
Um, and she tells a great story about how she lied to her therapist for the first year of therapy to make her therapist like her. Um, and then the two of them go on to talk about uh, how important therapy has been to them. So we'll just take a little listen to that. So when I went to America, and now I'm in my mid-twenties, for God's sake, I go, into, I go to America and finally, you'll love this one, I find myself a, 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 a psychiatrist. So I was really driven. I was still driven. I knew that I needed to take care of this. That was the, that was the backbone right there. That was the, I want to live. But I spent the first year lying to the psychiatrist because I didn't want him to hate me. Do you love that? I love it's just that. one of my <laughs> finest moments, I would say. And it makes me laugh to this day. Oh yeah. I didn't want him to like see the real me and hate me. I wanted him to love me because that's, you know, I'm the good child. I'm the good daughter. I'm the good child. And I want everybody to love me and not see the, the interior horror. And so finally, when I came clean and showed and actually revealed who I really was, he was dumbstruck. He could not believe oh, so anybody. He, did, he didn't pick up on it. He, no, he hadn't, didn't oh, wow. pick up on it. But, and he was one, he was a truly amazing psychiatrist, but that's how good I was. It's mm -hmm. how fine an actress I was. And that's how good I was at wearing my armor. But when he gave me, when he actually diagnosed what I had, and said, you know, you have clinical depression and, uh, uh, and a very uh, uh, chronic anxiety disorder. And you've also got PTSD from what you saw your mother going through and what you grew up with and everything. I mean, when he laid it out like this, I had something tangible mm. to, I mean, it was literally like having a hook on the wall that you could put your hat on. I could actually go, there it is, you know, there it is. You can't see it. You, you can't touch it, you can't, but I had it. I had the reason why I had been so, and I had this since I was a child. Yeah. It wasn't just watching my mother. I had it myself since I was a kid. So it was, it was two people under the same roof going through this. I mean, I knew what was going on. So from that point, it became, it was, it, that to me was a turning point. That was absolutely the fork in the road that, like Stefan's talking about is when you realize this is it. This is how it is. It's who I am. Still took me a long time to, to really take it in and get out from years and years and years of the self-loathing and the looking back and the looking back and if only and if only. But ultimately it was the greatest release I've ever felt in my life. So, yeah, the reason I really like that as well is that because it kind of got everyone involved in that topic as well. Evan was quite, um, quite excitable on it. And, um, and just particularly for Judith, the fact that it was, it was when she stopped lying, not only to the therapist, but to herself. Mm -hmm. And when she finally got a diagnosis that meant that she could start the process of just accepting what she had and, and what she was working with. Um, and, Stefan as well talking about how important that process of therapy has been to him and um and he mentions as well that that he was very good at coming up with lots of different coping mechanisms and he he uses the frame the phrase that uh that the coping mechanisms are all good in the in the moment but they just buy you time and that you actually need someone to sort of take the fog out of the way and uh and Stu you were talking in that conversation quite a lot as well about how important therapy yeah. was to you in the end as well yeah Definitely, there was there was so much like um, there was so many. Oh, we 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 drew a lot out of her in that sort of mm. session. I thought you know so much value. I I mm. felt um, absolutely incredible. And I thought what was really great about that conversation is you had three individuals with very different backgrounds sitting there, just talking about the value of therapy mm. and how good it's been. And it was a really just amazing conversation and just. So yeah. open and just brilliant. Yeah, and I think to. also the turnaround, yeah. particularly, um, I mean, with you as well, Stu, but, but with Judith and, and Stefan as well, that their their preconceptions about therapy before they went there. Yeah. And, and Stu, you mentioned in that conversation about joking about one flew over the cookie's nest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But just, yeah, I, just yeah. the fact that they they sort of all had, and Judith grew up in, the, in a family that was very much, don't talk about your emotions, yeah. don't talk about it. And um, yeah, and for, for you all to yeah, come she, full circle and just actually found it so useful in the end. She mentions about lying to a therapist and it's just like, I, I 
I felt like lying sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, and, and maybe once or twice a day, you know, are you all, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I don't need to be here. Yeah. You know, and you do need to, and, and it's, I think back to that, I think you're just wasting every, yours and everyone's time. Just tell them how you feel yeah. and you can move, and you can move forward. Um, and yeah, so I get where she was coming from with that, you know, lying to her therapist yeah. for so long. Wow, mm. Alice, your mm. next, uh, your next candidate. <laughs> so yeah, my next moment was between it was on the Sabrina Cohen Hatton um, and Josh Bodgie's episode. Um, this kind of comes up. There wasn't just one part. It's more. It keeps coming up as a dominant theme, looking at kind of identity and labelling. And I know we're just going to hear. Um, from Sabrina talking about experiencing homelessness. Yeah, let's have a little listen. But one other thing that I feel really strongly about when we talk about homelessness is not calling somebody homeless because homelessness is not your identity, it's an experience. So I'm always very careful with language around that because it's so easy to internalise this. It really, really is. Um, so it's it's a really challenging multifaceted problem and I don't think that you can look at any one piece in isolation but taking it away from someone's identity and saying look Mm. it's happened it happens it's okay there is a future is something that's really important and for me that's why I started to talk about it because I hid the fact that this happened for years and years and years I didn't talk about it I didn't offer it to people nobody knew this part of my life and I was worried about telling people because there was still a deep-seated part of me that felt ashamed of it And I know that it's wrong to feel ashamed. I've got nothing to feel ashamed of. But again, it's that internalised emotion and how you feel about something. So, yeah, Sabrina talks about um, experiencing homelessness. And she, as she says, she's very um, careful about the language she uses. She she experiences homelessness. She isn't homeless. And Josh uh, talks about this as well in a different way he was very reluctant to get involved in the Invictus Games because he didn't want to um he sort of felt like oh it's just going to be a load of disabled soldiers at a sports day and we're all just going to feel sorry for them and I think it's just this idea of labeling isn't it and what that means and um not allowing a label to define who you are and it to negatively impact on your confidence and your self-esteem and both of those two rejected those labels that wasn't them and they um and I think if they hadn't done that they probably wouldn't have gone on and done these amazing things that they had done and I just think all of us you know words they're just words but words as we know can be really powerful Mm. and So, yeah, we just, I suppose, just have to check ourselves and just be careful about the language that we use. Yeah. With ourselves as much as we... Yeah, totally. Yeah. With that conversation you have with yourself. Absolutely. For sure. Stuart, how about your your next one? Yeah, my next one is uh, Mark Billy Billingham and uh, a good mate of mine, Al Crow. And um, Billy... uh, talks very sort of humbly throughout the episode but something um that i find you know mine he was in charge of the whole everyone's familiar especially in the uk with um you know the 77 terrorist attack and he was in charge of absolutely everything emergency services you know and then get getting it you know, every single aspect you can think of in that mm. he 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 was the head honcho and um, he just very blase, you know, skates around it sort of thing. He doesn't see it. And that's that's one thing that strikes me with him, how absolutely humble he is. And it is, it was a very, you know, a landmark event. You know, if you think, if you used to think of a terror attack in the States, we jumped to 9-11. And if you think of a terror attack in the UK, we jumped to 7-7. And he was, you know, a, a, a lot of people are still walking around thanks yeah. to him. Yeah, well, let's listen to a little a little clip of Billy Billingham. I have to say, I mean, we had, we were sort of covering it, but something else was more going to happen. Mm. So our focus had switched a little bit. And, you know, when I say cut with our pants, then we weren't. We had it covered. It's just something. And, and obviously then that 
kicked in quicker and it was like whoa switch focus bang let's go yeah. and we had it covered pretty quick and, and you know and then it started to unravel this issue which was bigger than we expected you know but thank god we had it covered and we sorted it out and stuff we'll never be able to talk about thank god we don't want to but it was it was bonkers you know it's almost like the COVID thing now, as you know, on the streets of London. And what I, fa- I think, you know, if I have to say anything, the government was pretty good. They're, they're sort of good old British, you know, resilience. They're sort of, let's get back to normal. Yeah. And that was the right thing to do. Let's not let's not cower away from these and give them what they want. Let's get back on the buses. Let's get back on the transport. You know, but everyone was moving with caution, yeah. of course. And we had eyes and ears everywhere. And we were all over the place to make sure that we, we're not going to get caught again. And we didn't, thank God. Yeah, I agree. Stu, he had a real humbleness throughout all of that, uh, his whole episode, all of the things he was he was talking about, actually. that Yeah, his charity work, everything, yeah, you know, just... Yeah. yeah, and that it's just, like you say, it's a job that you have to do well and you have to be committed to it and you do it, but it's your job and it's what's expected of you and it's nothing... Yeah, he's not. He doesn't consider himself particularly special, uh, despite the fact that he's doing extraordinary, yeah. extraordinary things. Like, he, yeah, he could be stood in a bar, and that subject could come up. Yeah, and he would talk nothing about it. You know, many, many yeah. others would be. I did that. Yeah, I did yeah, that. yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, seven, seven. You know that I control yeah. that. Yeah. You know, he 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 probably wouldn't even bring it up. He yeah. would just yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Which is very much like my next one, actually, which is your favourite person in the world, Stu, um, Steve Swanson, yes. Swanee. Um, oh. And my moment with him, other than the fact that he's just, again, so blasé about all of his achievements, uh, it's, I mean, not blasé about space and about the things he's done, but just that you would think that he'd, I don't know, just sort of managed to make a cake or something in the way that he talks about the incredibly (laughs) complex hoops he had to jump through to get up there um but for me it was a moment where he talks about the importance of failure and um and you know the whole fail better thing is quite a well-known sort of maxim but but the spin that he put on it which was something that he was told by uh one of his superiors so We'll just have a little listen to that clip. So I got assigned to a special mission after uh, eight years of assignment and flew in nine years after I became an astronaut. Uh, But uh, this guy was a a really good uh, commander of the space shuttle. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was a Marine. And uh, but he sat me down and he said, you know, even though you're going to train for a year on this one mission and you're going to know your job inside and out, you are going to make mistakes. You are going to have failures. And 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 then so you have to learn how to deal with that in a sense of, and not let it really affect the rest of your work. You know, the, the, so he went, you know, you have to quickly, you know, figure out what went wrong, figure out why it happened, and, and you know, and not, what are you going to do not let it happen again, and then forget about it, and you got 30 seconds to do all that, and then you have to just let it go and forget about it, because you have another job right away. It's a, it's a very time, you know, sensitive environment. We are working, you know, like 18 hours a day, and you're just going nonstop. And so you don't have time to, to, you know, feel sorry for yourself or anything like yeah. that. You just have to move on. And so uh, it was really good because it did happen. You know, you don't think it's going to, but it did happen. So, and I've actually, I think it's a great life lesson in, in a way to just, you know, learn from your mistakes, you know, atone if you need to, but then move on, drop mm-hmm. it. It's just baggage you don't need. Yeah. The, the thing for me, I think is, is this idea of, of acknowledging the mistakes, first of all, being completely open to making them and the expectation that that you're going to with the most training in the world human error is a thing and it's going to happen so accepting that number one but where he talks about just learning from mistakes atone for them so actually you know if it's something that you you need to do but move on and there's a great phrase he says where it's just baggage you're carrying around otherwise Mm. and you can you can do without without that for sure Mm. um Yeah. yeah alice Mm. Your final moment. My final moment is uh, in the Emily Dean and Darren Swift episode. And Stu, actually, you started off and you um, talk about uh, you just come out of the neurological wing after being there, living there for a couple of years and how you go back and everyone's really afraid to tell you you know about the the challenging things yeah. that they're they're experiencing yes and yeah, emily yeah. 
just comes up to talk about top trumps. You know, I've experienced myself and even I feel in this situation with you guys who've been through that, I'm doing it. I'm doing, I'm playing top trumps with with trauma, you know, and actually there is no top trumps as we no. know. Um, I, um, and I'm really glad that you mentioned that because I think, again, we're doing what um, is important, which is you're getting it out there saying, well, you said that and you don't need to. So thanks. I just want to give you all a hug. But, um, but I, d I did experience that myself. Um, people withholding information from me, people saying, we better not see that film and sort of screening things, you know, it should be upset. It was yeah. all came from the most in be lovely, beautiful place. Mm but it makes you feel other. And I think when you're suffering from any sort of trauma or the, you know, the incidents that you guys went through, you feel other enough, for God's sake. It's like, what you want to feel is just, just treat me like everyone else. Um, yeah, I mean, I love this part of the conversation. And um, the sort of final bit of it is that Swifty goes on to say he that you know no one's special as well that we all go through these terrible things and um i just love the, the the fact that emily has said i haven't got you know i don't have top trumps on death Cy harmer in the last episode you know was like i don't have top trumps i'm a, I'm a double amputee but and effectively what they're saying is that you know it doesn't matter what you go through in life it might seem really small and insignificant but it isn't it is allowed and it is valid and even though Emily Dean's, you know, whole family has died, it doesn't mean she's got top trunk trumps on death. And I think this really struck home because the week before we did this episode, my dad died. And I just really needed to hear this. I needed to, yeah. like, hear that actually, you know, and I love the fact that Swifty was like, you're not special. None of it, you know, I love yeah. that. I'm not, loads of people's, you know, family is dying. Emily's, all of, all of her family had died. and But there in front of us was this wonderful, eloquent, brilliant individual who was so successful. And it just gave me so much comfort to hear this and just know that it, even though it didn't feel okay at that moment, it was going to be okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, no, she, she, for anyone who has lost anyone, she's an extraordinarily she, yeah, she's articulate yeah. and wonderful person who also talks with it, you know, she, she takes everything that happened very seriously, but she also doesn't take herself that seriously. So there's this wonderful yeah. contrast as well between just the, the empathy that she has for, for anyone who's gone through anything like that, combined yeah. with this yeah. sort of lightheartedness in a sense that isn't in any way disrespectful yeah. or sort of uh d d d kind of trying to divert her her own grief um and she yeah she's that that was a that was a, a big week that was our first episode that we yeah. recorded it was, and yeah. it was yeah. one of the most emotionally challenging mm, <laughs> episodes definitely, definitely. of the whole series um so yeah anyone who has experienced any loss like that, I, I highly recommend it. And just the the way that they also both talked, Swifty then talked as well about about the subject of loss. And obviously his loss yeah. was a, a slightly different one in terms of his physical loss. Um, yeah. But the, the steps that they both talk about, about their recovery as well was, uh, yeah, it was, yeah, that was great. And obviously, me and Alice presenting together, I knew what Alice had just experienced. So you, I thought you did a fantastic job there, Alice. And it, it was really good episode to be involved, but yet still very raw for mm. yourself. So, yeah, really, really Thanks, good Steve. work from all. Of yeah. That. Um. So, Stu, your your final highlight. Uh, so my last one is uh, Josh Bodgy and uh, Sabrina Cohen Hatton, and uh, Josh says something that um it i'll just just stop messing around and say it. <laughs> it's um he says accept your landing and it's something that was told to him when he was doing something called p company parachute company uh before he goes into his job uh, before he goes into the jump phase where you know they jump out of planes and stuff like that to get their wings yeah 
and um, yeah, he, uh, he he's told by the DS, the director staff, uh, you know, just accept your landing because it's not going to be smooth. You know, at nine times out of ten, they're, they're all just learning, so it's not going to be smooth. It is going to be rough. So they're just told, get your mind around it, accept your landing, and he's used that throughout. You know, especially with you know becoming the tri- triple amputee and stuff, he's used that through everything, and I think everyone could use that. You know that line. Yeah. You know, accept your landing. For sure. Um, just like, sometimes, just accept what's coming your way, deal with it. The be- you know, just go into it with the best of your ability, and nine times out of ten, you will come out better than what you thought. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and th- there's a s- similar term when you know when I was going through training, uh, called the um, standard rub <laughs> in the in the in the guards, and uh, obviously you all know that we stand outside Buckingham Palace, but you have to be absolutely immaculate. And uh, what was told to us from day one was when you've got your kit, kit on you, you know, your black diamond boots and your buff belt and your, your big bear skin with your curved chain around your chin and everything that has to be absolutely sparkling. Um, you know, there's, there's usually always you've forgotten something or you've missed a bit or something like that. And you, if you get picked up, uh, you, you can, you know, you, you end up uh, on show parade and stuff like that, you know, at 10 o'clock at night and five in the morning, it just ruins your life. So, um, so you have to, your kit has to be immaculate. But when you stood there, if you stand rigid and tall and massive and, you know, proud, you know, stand and rub, you know, they will just look at this guy and think, yeah, that's a smart guardsman. Let's pass him to the next guy and inspect him. And uh, it was, uh, yeah, so I don't know, <laughs> stand and rub was my <laughs> thing. But I do I think I'm going to steal yeah. Josh's because it's a bit more workable. Yeah. Uh, except your yeah. landing. Okay, well, let's have a little listen to that. When you jump out of an aeroplane, military sort of static line parachuting, you can't really control the landing. You've just got to accept your landing and hope for the best, really. Um, so, yeah, yeah. well, I, I wouldn't say that for, for how I felt at the time. It was more <laughs> like, um, right, this has happened. Life goes on. Do I sit here and feel sorry for myself or do I try and put my life back bit by bit um, and like I said, I went to Headley Court, which is Defence Medical Rehab Centre in Epsom. Just moved to Stanford Hall now. And you get there and there's literally just robots walking around everywhere. Literally guys with legs missing, half their heads missing, arms missing. And it it sounds weird, but it's amazing because you feel normal there. And you can see guys that have been injured further down the line from you and you aspire to get to where they are in their recovery journey. So for me, it was get there and, right, get that wheelchair in the cupboard. Let's get walking, um, which is what I did. Great. Well, my final one is also Miss Emily Dean. Um, I was thinking about Chris Akabusi's dinghy story, which is possibly my <laughs> favourite moment yeah, that's yeah. of the, the entire yeah. series. Uh, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, you need to listen to that episode <laughs> because it's so that's, funny. The that's dinghy. the most yeah. extraordinary yeah. Yeah. That's tea. Yeah, exactly. I just like the profession specific uh, shoplifting as a child is is a is a remarkable thing. Um, no, my my last one is again um, Emily, and uh, Alice mentioned earlier about her father. We had a bit of a week, didn't we, Alice? Mm, we did. And <laughs> um, I'm now going to do the top trumps thing as well, and that I lost my mom <laughs> and my granddad <laughs> in the week. Well, a couple of weeks before and. I, funnily enough, had had, reser- had done a research interview with Emily the weekend before my mum died. And then we recorded the episode a couple of weeks after she she died. So a lot of that episode, I was very glad I wasn't doing any presenting. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I could just sit in silence and, and hide and, and watch Alice do her thing. But um, there was a, a, a conversation that... Um, was had about the focus that being around death or being around somebody who is dying brings to your life. Um, So let's just hear that little section now. I remember being in the intensive care unit and this incredible doctor who's also very good looking, but that's not the point. He, um, (laughs) yeah, well, I like that because I was talking to my sister and I knew she'd enjoy that. I was, because I had an embarrassing moment with him and I said, oh, that doctor looks like a GQ model and he was standing right behind me. And he said, oh, thank you. (laughs) Um, But I, I remember he said to me, and I never forgot it. He said, people always talk about living in the present, don't they? But they never do. He said, it only happens in situations like this, a life or death 
situation. Like Swifty, you were in the moment. You had decisions to make. Got to got to get out of here. Um, I'm devastated about my mate, but I don't have time to this. I have to survive now, and I have to prevent more deaths. You know, so I think for me that's what it felt like in a in a much lesser scale. You know, but but I definitely felt that changed me because I it was the first time I'd ever experienced that sense of. No one mentioned yesterday. No one mentioned tomorrow in the intensive care unit. It's the only place I'd ever noticed that. And I'm sure it's similar in the army. You're not going, oh, I was really upset about what my mate did yesterday. It's like, mate, there's stuff going on. We're going to die. If you keep talking like that, you need to move on. And so I would see that there were similarities in some way between those two experiences because I was so purely focused on the moment and what it meant, hideous as that was, tragic as it was for a, a young mum to, to die like that and lose her life. What it, the legacy, and I see that in a positive way, that she left an extraordinary legacy because we were all changed. Um, I started having therapy. I went to my sister's therapist, which was great because um, I sort of thought, well, I don't have time for previously on ER with a new one. I need them to know everything. <laughs> But it, but it does, I held on to that. And when I got low, that living in the moment thing was what saved me, what I'd learned in the intensive care unit. And how that manifested itself in my life was, um, I had a list I always called the um, things I always say I'm going to do, but never actually do. I'm going to get a dog. I'm going to decorate my house and get floral wallpaper. Yeah. <laughs> um, all these things, you know, I'm going to write a book. Um, I always said that, but instead I watched Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, you know, or played with other people's dogs. And that's what I think was was life changing for me, was being able to access that feeling and knowing what it felt like for life to end for someone else, you know, which, again, is something you guys experience all the time. So um, or have experienced and that's very powerful, you know, and it's it changed my life that moment. Yeah, I think I think. And I'm sure it was the same for you, Alice, um, that there really is. There's something Emily talks about, you know, sort of intensive care units and how everything is immediate. It's not you're not looking into long term and worrying about long term. You're literally getting through the next moment, getting through the next moment. What do we need now? Um, and for me, the two things from from this section were with that with, was, you know, you literally don't know what's around the corner and the, the, sometimes the best way you can live is moment to moment or at least having more of a balance between the two than so many people just constantly looking uh, ahead and not thinking about what's happening at the moment. But also she talks about having the list of things that she'd always said to herself at some point she would do and just suddenly realizing, why am I not doing them now? We just, none of us know how long we have, mm. none of us. And actually just, just remembering that rather than it being mm. a really morbid thing, actually can really inspire you to just get the thing done write the book mm -hmm. do the trip whatever it is that you want to do um so that was yeah that was a, a really sort of profound moment for me how did you feel about that one Alice yeah I totally I just nodding my head throughout that <laughs> <laughs> I just thought I totally agree like and I know I'm stating the obvious here but when you die that's it yeah. That is it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it doesn't matter what you've got in your house or how much money you've got in your bank account. It doesn't matter because you're not around. And so go and just live. And and I also think, like, I know she was like, I she put up her wonderful wallpaper and she got her lovely dog, Ray. <laughs> you know, but just go and have a good day. Just, like, mm. smile and just, like, be grateful that you have these amazing, amazing, you know, things in your life and... Just find the good, find the good. Um, sure. Yeah. Well, I think that's a pretty good note to end on. Alice Driver and Stuart Harris, thank you very much. Thank you so much for the opportunity to do this. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much, Anna. It's been Thanks, amazing. Jay. So that is the end of the second series of the Resilient Sessions. It has been totally amazing to meet all these incredible people and record it. I hope you've enjoyed listening. So if you'll bear with me, I'd like to thank a few people. Thank you to my co-host, Stuart Harris, our producer, Hannah Whittingham, our editor, Adam Wimpany, Grace Stanyland, Chewy Critchfield, Frankie Mapes, Hatherly, who run the Making Generation R programme. 
Sarah Mayo, who runs our marketing, all the MGR Blesman participants, and our amazing trainers, Al Najari, Claire Murphy, Kate Beals, Phil Peacock, Jack Pinter, who I can't believe I forgot your surname, and Corinne Mikalef. This podcast was generously funded by Blesma, the limbless veterans charity, delivered by The Drive Project, supported by Facebook, and presented by me, Alice Driver, creator of the Making Generation R campaign. Huge thanks go to Cy Harmer, whose idea lit the torch paper of this podcast, and all you do for us on social media. And of course, to you for listening. If you've been affected by any of the issues discussed, then please take a look at our webpage or show notes where you'll be able to find more information on support services. Should you like to listen to any of our veterans' incredible stories, they are available as part of this podcast series. The Resilient Sessions grew out of the Making Generation R campaign, a project that trains injured veterans from Blesma to tell their stories so far to over 100,000 people from the young and vulnerable to frontline services and first responders across the UK. To find out more about Making Generation R and to book a free talk and workshop if you're a school or first responder, just Google Making Generation R. If you've enjoyed listening today, then please do subscribe, give us a five-star review and share it with anyone who you think will enjoy it. Thanks.